we're going to get the. I wanted to wait for that one. I didn't want to get started with that. So um, thank you for all. I, I really appreciate uh, the kind uh, the kind introduction. Um, yeah, I'm often feel self conscious when I hear my, about myself. I'm, I'm always wondering if everyone in the audience is saying, "Does this guy really know what he's doing, or what's he going to do next?" So, uh, so with that being said, I just want to start this lecture by telling you who I am and what I'm doing here in France. Uh, as Flora said, I'm an, I'm an architect, but I'm really a lifelong student of places. I, uh, I first learned how to design places as an architect student. Then I went into my graduate studies and learned how to conserve historic uh, places. And then later as a practitioner, I restored and conserved historic monuments. And for the last 20 years, I have been uh, writing about heritage and the meanings of heritage on historic monuments. Um, and I'm currently working on uh, research for my next book, which focuses on iconoclasm. And uh, so, let me see. So why am I researching iconoclasm in France? Um, to paraphrase American jurist Oliver Wendell Holmes, I quote, kind of quote, because unlike America, where the soil is not humanized enough to be interesting, I come to France where the soil has been well trodden by French feet and has been become itself part of the culture that is experienced by the current generation. And we could say this about a lot of countries all over the world, but France is different. France has always loved its, its art and architecture, but it's also had a nuanced relationship with it. Um, it has embraced its cultural treasure, but it's also scrutinized how they were built or created, and at times questioned their existence, disfigured them, removed them, or destroyed them, and then replaced them. So the history of French patrimonial management reflect these conflicting attitudes. And we're seeing this, seems like, on an hourly basis today. So I want to kind of also bring you into something of my perspective as an American. Um, we Americans have been sensitive about our limited artistic and cultural legacy. And I want to just kind of start out by, by talking about, you know, our insecurity about our standing culturally in the world with these two paintings here. One is by the uh, the entrance to the Museum of the Louvre and St. Louis Church. And that is really kind of, it embodies, especially at this period of, the, of early 19th century art and neoclassicism, how how French artists were were celebrating the, the the creations around them that had been that they inherited, and what on the right is a painting by Thomas Cole, uh, who was uh, one of the leaders of what they, we call in the United States the Hudson River uh, painting school of art, school, and you'll notice it is it's a it's a landscape scene uh, in Pennsylvania, I believe. And uh, and this kind of shows you really kind of a dichotomy of of what is different with France and the United States. Um, French, the French, French had art, they had architecture, and we Americans had untamed natural beauty. So I argue that that perception still is felt today both in France and the United States. For example, if, we, if you look at the listings of the World Heritage Sites in, in the United States, which we are, have about set, around 70, over uh, half of them are of natural of sites of natural beauty, like Yellowstone National Park or Yosemite, um, and there were Grand Canyon. And in France, almost all of the sites World Heritage Sites are of cultural places. 
So that, that, there you can start to see what we're, we're talking about, about the French perception of, of their art and ours. And another example, it's another set of examples I'm giving you, are, are these two buildings. The one you see on the left is the, is the uh, Palace Garnier, and on the right is the uh, Library of Congress. And the front, you know, when Darnay's great opera house was built in 1875, it really was, and it still is, an expression of French dominance in art, architecture, and performing art, ballet, opera, et cetera. And, and that was a clear, clear uh, statement that Paris and France wanted to make in the late 19th century. Two decades later, the United States erected the Library of Congress. And it's, it's, I, I can't believe I had two images that, of the same vantage point. I mean, that's really remarkable, but you can see the similarities. And while, what we were doing to express with, with Beaux Arts' new classical architecture, building the Library of Congress, was that our dominance of innovation. We think of you know, Americans think of themselves not as cultural, but are being innovative, industrial. And so you can see that was our retort to Garnier's brilliance in Paris. So Holmes Flip, French neoclassical painting in the American Hudson River Valley School painting, L.A. Garnier and the Library of Congress. These examples illustrate France's pride in their culture and America's insecurity of theirs. America's cultural pride developed in the second half of the 20th century. For example, the Kennedy Center, America's our, uh, opera house, was only built just a few, 50 years ago. David Lowenthal, James McPherson, and other notable American scholars have stated that America is a young country and a post-colonial one. We've always been acutely aware that we do not have a built, built patrimony and a heritage as long and as developed as found in Europe, especially in France. We tend to be, begin our history in 1607 for Massachusetts in Virginia, in 1607 or Massachusetts in 1620, much to the annoyance of our North American indigenous colleagues. When European-centric Americans trace their ancestral roots, they typically stop when their ancestors came to the New World. You often hear from Americans saying things like, my ancestor arrived here on the Mayflower, or my great-grandfather went through Ellis Island. Do you consider their family history in America extends beyond the, before the American Revolution and into the old world? Throughout our history, Americans have compensated for our lack of, of collective culture by striving to be progressive and innovative. We often torn down We've often torn down what we've seen as old and replaced it with newer and bigger. We both emulate a European culture and especially French culture, then we act to it, often through demolition. During the last half of the 20th century, through our industrial might, we projected our culture onto the world. For instance, our interpretation of modernist architecture, rock and roll music, blue jeans, the internet, and, and fast food. It's terrible that we thrusted fast food on the world. Uh, three short years from now, the U.S. will celebrate the 250th anniversary of its, of its founding. Compared to France, the U.S. is still a young country, but it's no longer an infant one. Now, well into the 21st century, the U.S. and Canada, and I will, you know, I wanted to, I want to emphasize that it's North America, this is a North American thing, perhaps even a Western Hemisphere uh, focused idea it is now considering that it too has a built patrimony and we and that we must now figure out whether we want to live with it or eradicate it. What I'm learning in France right now is that if this is a complicated and ongoing struggle that can span across the centuries. So I want to talk about where I'm coming from with this, as I mentioned earlier, I am a, I'm, a, I'm an architect and a conservator, and then I became a scholar. And 20 years ago, 
as Flora mentioned, I was at the University of North Carolina, both as a, as a lecturer and as the historic architect for that campus. And we had a statue uh, that's right there on the left. It was this postcard. Uh, it was called, uh, it was a statue commemorating the uh, students that died fighting for the Confederate States of America during the American Civil War in 1861 to 1865. And it was known politically across campus as Silent Sam. And uh, in Silent Sand, when I was the university architect, historic architect, uh, it was routinely vandalized. And sometimes that vandalism was random. Sometimes it was an act of political expression. But all the while, it was my job to restore the, the monument and put it back on its pedestal, and we, could, we would go on. Um, you know, in, we never, technicians like me never questioned the meanings of the existence of those statues or the meanings of why they were being marred. But uh, in 2018, long after I had left North Carolina, students and activists did pull it down and destroy the statue. And then, of course, three, two years later, the George Floyd uh, the George Floyd protest happened throughout the United States and in Europe and in South America. Uh, and this, and these events that have occurred and with more and more frequency, that has compelled me to, to think about iconoclasm from a philosophical standpoint, not just from a technical point. And that's what I'm trying to learn here in France. So we are now in, in the United States, being a young country, like I just mentioned, we have really never have gone through a period of, of iconoclasm like we're going through right now. Um, and we're not, and although we understand what the, uh, happens with the object that's being marred, we're not considering the broader context, the, the urban place, the square, the, uh, the avenue. And a case in point, this is going to be an, an, a case study I'll present to you is um, is this. This is the um, this is Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. It was uh, built between 1890 and 1930, and it was a Beaux Arts Avenue that was built to commemorate uh, generals and politicians from the con Confederacy during of the Civil War, the, the ones that fought for slavery, and um, and it was it was. A venerated avenue. It was considered one of the most beautiful urban spaces in the United States. Um, it was placed on our U.S. National Historic Landmark list in the 1980s, and scholars have been writing about this avenue for for decades. Um, when George Floyd, when the George Floyd riots happened, it was it was pretty much radically changed forever. Uh, and and many of their monuments were completely transformed through vandalism that became icon, 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 iconoclastic art. So much so that the New York Times, this is on the Robert E. Lee monument, which is over here on the right, deemed that iconoclasm as the most influential work of American protest art since the ninth, Second World War. But you would think that that would, is interesting, but you would think that would be something that would be either kept or thought about, but it was quickly, it was removed in less than a year later uh, by the city of Richmond, Virginia. So, yeah, so I, I, I've come to France to understand iconoclasm as a historic mo moment, transformed artifact, and even a work of art and architecture. Historian Peter Weibel is correct in saying that, that since the French Revolution, the breaking of images and destruction of idols has been linked to the rhetoric of progressive revolutionary politics. Frederick uh, Bumgarner, an art historian from Colombia, reinforces his argument by stating that the question in France of the integration of, of the artistic heritage from the ancient regime into the new royal regime engendered during the French Revolution engendered intense political debates. 
She agrees with Richard Clay and Stanley, and Stanley I. Deserta that during the revolution, two competing views on the ancient regime's artistic heritage were debated, destruction and preservation. But what I'm learning is that in France, iconoclasm didn't stop at the French Revolution. When France experienced several periods of iconoclasm, and these, these events impacted French built patrimony. And today we are we're seeing iconoclasm happening in incredible frequency. Every time it seems like I turn on the television having dinner, I'm seeing something happening like that. You know, some some sort of destructive act that is meant to be as a political expression that may even be, may last even longer than that. And I mean, here's two examples that have happened very recently. Um, on the left is uh, right wing extremists uh, destroyed or partially destroyed but a new monument to Emir Abdel Qader, who was a, a, re a leader of the Algerian independence movement uh, in the late 19th century in Ambrose. And then last month, just down the street from where we are right now, uh, not a hard walk, is the, uh, is the, the vandalism or the, the iconoclasm that happened in Pontoise of the statue of General uh, Victor Charles uh, Manuel Leclerc, who, has, uh, who was a, uh, a general from Napoleon and who also rose to the slave trade in the French Caribbean. So you can say that disfranchisement and dissidence can be the motives for iconoclasm, but I'm discovering that iconoclasm can happen both in the popular realm, as in the streets, but it also can become part of government policy. But what is different today than it has been in the past across the world is there's just an, an enormous diversity of opinions regarding what we should be destroying or what we should be bar, uh, keeping uh, among historians, artists, philosophers, and politicians, which is different than what we've experienced in the past. So. I, let me tell you where I'm, how I'm approaching this this project. Uh, since, as I keep reminding y'all, I am an architectural conservator and a scholar of heritage studies. So I'm approaching this project a little differently than an art historian or an architectural historian. Um, first, I, I've been experiencing where iconoclasm has occurred, like in Pontoise, uh, and then I've researched about it in a way I am embracing a 19th century approach to understanding places that was popularized by Charles Baudelaire. I am a flaneur, a casual wanderer and observer of street life in the modern city, but not to the extreme of Baudelaire. As, as Walter Benjamin, perhaps the foremost Baudelaire to admire, defines the idea, I am a flaneur who is interested in how objects relate to the space around them and how our act actions affect both the object and the space. Since Baudelaire's day, Paris has always been the ideal city to be a flaneur. The great literature works dating back to the 18th century proved this to be true. And by synchronizing myself with the unsettling experiences which are occurring today in Paris, especially of how Parisians are using their streets and public squares with its memorable built heritage for, public, for, for political expression, I hope, as Benjamin argued about Baudelaire's work, to begin to learn how to how we how we as a collective people understand the past in the present and determine the future of our built patrimony. Psychologist Bobby Seal argues that it is through the viewpoint of the Flaneur that we can begin to understand a more holistic history, not just one written by the victor. So I'm trying to understand right now iconoclasm across multiple stages of French history, not just the, the French Revolution, but the July Revolution of 1830, the Franco-Prussian War, the First World War, and most notably, the Second World War. And we'll see a lot of this in this presentation. Uh, and, they, and you know, with popular and institutional motives for the iconoclasm, there were also measures in terms of uh, policy and and law 
to try to correct that. And that's been a very interesting back and forth. Um, but really, I'm learning right now that there is a life and a death and a life cycle with historic monuments in France. I mean, one of the things that I found very interesting is that most of the, the great statues that you see when you walk around Paris are not the original statues. They were, some of them, most of them have been uh, replacements, like what we see here in the, in the Place de la Victories. Uh, statue you see there is a, that you're going to see today is a replacement. It was, uh, it was pulled down in 1792, and then during the restoration, uh, monument was put back exactly the way it was, which I find very interesting. So, I mean, there, this is uh, it, what I'm learning is that there's just a key, you know, that monuments have means and that they can have a sense of permanence, but iconoclasm can come into that, you know in a big way and change things rather quickly. So one thing I am saying, you know, one thing that I, I agree with, with a lot of scholars is that from, from Rome to this present day, statues have, have fallen, have come in favor and have fallen into favor, usually target, usually a reaction to a historical figure. But what is different from the late 19th century through the 20th century and into today, is that we that we may be seeing a lot of iconoclasm happening, but that's because we have a lot of statues around us, uh, and you know we have this we've been piling statues all around us in every town, every uh, municipal area. Um, Maurice Alagon called this phenomenon that starting in after the at the mid part of the 19th century, statue mani, a mania for putting up statues. And uh, it it gained momentum, this mo movement gained momentum um, when when French statue statuary art, monumental art, became less allegorical, like the Mar Marianne monument or, or allegorical figure for liberty and became more literal, like figures of history, or figures for co a common people, like the poli, uh, which is the, translated, as I understand it, as the fair one, the French, the common French soldier of World War I. You know, um, United States, we have the Doughboy, I think the British have the Tommy. Uh, there was always this expression of this, of this every man, every man soldier, and monuments, after the First World War, proliferated to memorialize them. Um, but French women championed the creation of Paris um, to remind the French government of their, of their obligation to support French families whose brothers or fathers or husbands were killed during the war. Um, and then in the United States, starting really in the after, a little before the Civil War, uh, we start seeing a similar movement by American women placing monuments for of, of soldiers like Silent Sam of, of for the Confederacy, and this was interesting because it's also and that's stat, the statue in the middle shows that um, these statues were not only just uh, an expression of memorial to uh, fallen Confederate soldiers, but also a way of expressing. Uh, uh, political power by in, in early forms of feminism throughout the American South and in the Midwest, which you can see in the last pic, pic slide, picture in the slide, a memorial to the Northern Army in Illinois. So you can start to see, we have a lot of statues accumulated throughout our landscape. But how do these statues work? And, uh, and how do we um, how do we place meaning on them? Richard Clay explains it this way. We see it, it's by and I'm gonna use I'm using Louis XIV as an example. Uh, that there's two parts to uh, the meanings of a of a statue. One of a of a figure. One is the signifier, and one is the signified. Uh, the signifier is 
the intention created either by, both by the artist and the patron of, of what the statue is. And it's pretty much immediately, we, we immediately know, for instance, that that is Louis XIV when it's in front of the Chateau de Versailles. Uh, and we know that because of the meaning of, of, of Louis XIV uh, in, in history and in other art. And then, then there's a second part, the signified part, which is the things and meanings that we place on, on the object. So, I mean, when, when we look at Louis XIV, we may be also thinking about other meanings in, um, in French history or French heritage. Uh, and so that, that can be accumulating over generations. There could be various meanings and personal, both personal and societal, placed on that on that statue, and that's the signified. So, um, and so, and, and historic monuments, because of that, can be polysemantic. They can have multiple meanings and uh, become capable of having all sorts of reactions by various people. And then, you know, by we can also see, and this is where iconoclasm comes in how people take a monument and transform it in a way that was never the way it was intended to be. And this is a case, another case study I'm going to present. Just down, oops, yeah. Just down on the Pont de Arma is the Liberty, the Flame of Liberty model. And this was given to, to Paris by the United States in 1987 as a commemoration for the centennial of the, of the Statue of Liberty given, being, given to, um, being given to France, I mean, given to the United States from France. And that was what it was until 10 years later, when right above it, or below it, excuse me, was the tunnel alma. And that was where Princess Diana was, was killed in an automobile accident. And so, and because of also some serendipity that Elton John, at a funeral, we wrote Candle in the Wind as a funeral eulogy song to it. Those kinds of ideas, signified ideas, became, a became part of the statue. And so you start to see people have glued and, and fixed images of Princess Diana at the, at the base of this monument. There are the love locks on the chains. I, I never have done a love lock. Uh, around it. And so now all of a sudden, the flame of liberty on the point at uh, Place d'Alma is now the Princess Diana monument at the Place Diana. And this, so this is a, a good, this is an example of, of iconoclasm, of how popular iconoclasm, of how people take uh, a monument that has one sort of meaning and then change the meaning by, by expressing through another art form on it and therefore changing its meaning and its, and its look. Now, you know, if you don't look at the bottom, that, that's still the same of liberty. But if you go look around it, it's, it's totally changed. And so that's, that's something that shows kind of like what I'm talking about, about people using that, you know, a lot of different ways of expression to change a meaning of a monument. And so one of the obvious uh, ways that iconoclasm happens is through vandalism. And in, in iconoclasm, it is related to vandalism, but it's not the same. Uh, it's, vandalism, I would I argue, would be a means to making iconoclasm, but not iconoclasm by itself. Vandalism, although pejorative and class, can be conceptual and can be a conceptual and theoretical idea in art, but and it must be considered seriously considered when examining the present conditions and the future of historic urban places. But as and this has been a this is a great quote, French art historian Louis Rowe distinguishes vandalism from iconoclasm by first stating what iconoclasm technically is, historically is. And it's you know, literally Greek for icon or image and class for breaker. And it was, and he attributes it to uh, the Byzantine clergy 
was sought out to follow Emperor Leon III's edict to destroy our adoration symbols and images of Christ, thus a premeditated act that is based on a political or cultural belief. He then, Rowe, then points out that vandalism is a human, the difference is a human bestial instinct, motive, a motive of destruction, greed and end of greed, envy, intolerance, or quite simply stupidity. But more importantly, in an urban setting, he states that it is an act of destruction or damage of private of public property of statues and buildings um, that that reacts and that and changes the identity of a culture and its heritage. And heritage, that's this is this is where it gets really interesting in my opinion. His his last point is uh, because it starts to think about heritage and the Pisonic meaning of the monument, and that what people are doing, whether they are taking on a figure like Louis XIV or another object like the flame by uh, Point Alma, is that they are challenging the cultural heritage meaning of the, of the signifier of the monument. And so Lowenthal distinguishes heritage from history, and that's an important part that I also want to bring up. Heritage is not history. History explores, this is Lowenthal, history explores and explains the past grown ever more, more opaque over time. Heritage clarifies past as to infuse them with present purposes. This delineation has always been a part of iconoclasm, but the, the big idea with iconoclasm is iconoclasm is a physical manifestation of the change of meaning of a of our of our historic object. So, you know, when iconoclasm becomes part of the, of the built landscape or a built part of, of art, like this right here, it can uh, it can react to the symbol and, and it can react to and but and be part of the object, but be different as well. And this is an example uh, in uh, Bologna, Italy. Of a of one of the fascist buildings built by Mussolini on the on the Italian Austrian border of a small town. It's like one of the earliest fascist buildings uh, or fascist complexes built. And what they did was at night using LED lights have transposed over the of uh, the bas relief uh, this idea that you know the, the monument says you know obey the obey the laws or believe obey and fight. And the LED display at night says no one has the right to obey in in German, Italian, and Latin. So I mean, this is that, so. This is what I'm talking about about in, interpretations um, as a transformed artifact. And now, iconotism can become a completely separate piece of work of art, especially when it's separated from the object and is and is becoming something to look at by itself. This is uh, the, the photograph, uh, a photograph from uh, Pierre Yohan, who was a photographer during the Second World War. And he was taking pictures of monuments that had been destroyed, and we'll get to that, during the Second World War. And then monuments can be a historic monument in their own right. Uh, I don't know how many of you all been to try, Metro, the Metro uh, train five. Uh, it's fascinating. It's, it's, you know, this art installation, this historic installation of the art of the archaeology of the Bastille. Uh, so, I mean, really, by code, you really shouldn't have a barrier to come putting out like that. But, I mean, this is something that is, uh, that is important. And the exhibit just talks about not only the, the infamous prison or you know, the Bastille, but also its destruction. And, and as a physical record, you have a, the cornerstone in the metro station. And then in the third, in the middle of the slide, I, I'm showing uh, the structure of a bas relief at Saint Chapelle. That was also during, during the French, uh, French Revolution. And so it, it marks that how Saint Chapelle had survived the French Revolution. Uh, and that's the reason why this. Element. This artifact is being showcased 
in its uh, on its ground floor. And then in the Arc de Triomphe, you see fragments of the other the, of the sculptures of the Arc de Triomphe that were destroyed by the German by Prussian soldiers during the Franco-Prussian War as objects to celebrate French resilience. So you can see this is this is the, another way that we're that France looks at iconoclasm as not just a fait complete, but something that goes on in, in a new form. But one of the things that um, that makes let me find my notes here. Ah. Um, one of the things that makes iconoclasm an interesting idea to explore in France is that how monuments and spaces have worked together, especially in, in, in design going back to um, the neoclassical era of Jacques Gabriel, um, and then later defined by Germain Buffon. And that is the idea of convenience. And the convenience in, in architectural or urban design, but the way the, the way the French neoclassicists understood it, is a principle that the, the, uh, that the space corresponds to the stat and, and the objects corresponds to the status of the patron. Thus, the state, thus the state the space is designed to celebrate the statue, and the two works are intricately, intricately intertwined. In other words, the space needs the monument, and the monument needs the space. And so that that is something that I think has been very interesting to study in, in France. And this is a good example. It's a case in point. And this is the uh, statue of Henri de Cato at uh, Pont Neuf. Um, two days after the, uh, the French monarchy was abolished and, and Louis XVI was beheaded, this monument of Henri de Cato right there at Pont Neuf was pulled down. And, uh, and this was like the first time during the French Revolution that people went, hmm. This, I wish we hadn't gone that far. You know, Henri de Cato was was a was a kind of a beloved figure in French history, uh, kind of a hero of the people's king, and uh, and there was a lot of kind of buyer's remorse, if you will, of of taking the statue down. So much so that um, on Jacques David, great artist, who's a radical revolutionary proposed removing, I mean, proposed a new statue in its place that would be, called, he called it Liberty Triumphant. And here's, you've got the allegorical figure of Liberty. And it's lit, he's on a carriage being pulled by oxen. And they're literally trampling over um, debris of broken statues. I, mean, I find that, and then there's people in the middle in the front killing the other royalty in front of him and an angel of death killing the, you know, it's very, very dramatic. I just found it very interesting. Here's a statue that had a connotation kind of embedded in it in the beginning, you know. And so that that was something that I, I thought that was, was was pretty pretty interesting. And of course, what we were talking about earlier in by the by the time the restoration happened in 1818, statues that I've of the monarchy were being replaced, like the one I was talking about earlier in the Place de la Victory. Um, so we, so you see, you have this one group comes and destroys a statue, and another group comes back and brings it back. Part of that is that because the spaces, especially in Paris, have been um, built, designed for those those statues, and so we. When we take away a statue that has belonged in a place, that becomes a problem. And then, so, the, but, and that that was something that the that French planners and policymakers, as well revolutionary as well as uh, post revolutionary, struggled with uh, throughout the first half of the nineteenth century. And I'm going to give you two examples. And this is. Iconoclasm as a reactionary act and iconoclasm as a reconciliation act. And, you know, there's probably no other iconoclast as large or as grand of an iconoclastic work of art than the Pantheon. It was originally uh, built as L'Eglise Saint-Genis, 
Um, and the French revolutionaries purposely went after it to change its use completely. Why? There was two reasons. One was um, this is kind of anti-Catholic. One was uh, that Saint Genevieve was the patron saint of Paris. And so to obliterate her meaning in Paris was something the French revolutionaries were interested in doing. Uh, and the second was that it was, um, you know, one of the last great architectural works by uh, the ancient regime, especially funded by, uh, by Louis the Fifteenth. So when they commemorated it as, as the Pantheon for Great French Men, uh, Patrick, uh, let's see, it's not, I never can remember to pronounce his name. Um, Dr. Mad de Quincy, the revolutionary architect, came and he, he literally filled in 38 of the 42 windows in the Pantheon. You can walk around the Pantheon and see where those windows used to be. And he, he took down the, the steeple towers, he took down the great skylights. The original architect, Sufro, wanted it, it to be a marriage between the, the light and storing heights of Gothic, or French Gothic architecture, and the mathematical precision of Greek and Roman architecture. So he was trying to bring in more light, whereas Quincy uh, made it even darker. And then, of course, when you walk into it, there are spaces that were designed for sacred use, uh, chapels, apses, naves, et cetera, that were then changed through uh, architecture and art uh, into spaces that celebrate the, the French Republic. Even the Tempanium, which originally had Saint Genevieve and, and other religious icons in it, was dismantled, destroyed, and, uh, and figures of the, of the revolution were placed in it. So you can see this is a reactionary uh, work of iconoclasm. Now, on the right is the Place de Concorde, which in, in 1792 was, uh, was still the Place de la Louis uh, Catours. And it was then, of course, after the, after the monarchy was, was abolished and the king and queen's heads were uh, cut off in that very place, it became the Place de la Concorde. But then it became, um, and then during the Restoration, it became once again the Plus Louis XVI. And, uh, and then after, in 18, after the 1830 Revolution, it became once again the Plus de la Concorde. And during that time, it had various statues in the middle, in the middle of it. One was the statue of Louis XIV. It was, it was the, pulled down during the French Revolution. And it was then replaced with a statue, a plaster statue of Frederick, uh, Francois Frederick Lemieux, who was representing as an allegorical figure, Liberty. And then it was destroyed, and the monarchy then placed the statue of Louis the Sixteenth in, in the place, plus, which was then destroyed. And then in 1836, it was agreed on that an obelisk bought from the Sultan of Egypt would be brought in and placed in the center of the Place Concorde. Now, that's an interesting story because here is, number one, the name change from a, chain, a name of royalty to Concorde. Concorde French means agreement or uh, reconciliation in a lot of ways. Um, and so, and then, of course, um, in an object that has absolutely no relationship to French history an object from ancient Egypt. So you have this going on, and this, so this is, an, I argue, uh, an iconoclastic art act of the reconciliation among a group of people. So, so lately, and this has been very interesting, I have been researching about the iconoclasm that occurred during the Second World War. Um, and this is, um, something that I think France is still trying to grapple with today. Um, during the, the, the occupation, the German occupation, and then the 
uh, establishment of the Vichy uh, government uh, in Vichy. Uh, the, the, uh, the Vichy government passed a law, which was, I think, told they were passed by the Germans, uh, that the that there would be a um, that all bronze monuments would be removed for um, for the German war effort, and um, this was um, this was interesting. It's called the Le Loire Relative or Le Monument de Sachy et Monument Matelique en vue de la Repentance, and it and it didn't. Like I said, it only, required, it only specified bronze statues. It uh, didn't include iron statues or iron or works, other metal uh, works of art. It didn't include stone monuments or, and, and, and excluded monuments for saints and kings and queens. Um, now, the Vichy government um, to, uh, instructed all the departments to develop a list of monuments that they that they recommended would be destroyed, and they when they said that they would be compensated for the removal of the bronze statues and the weight of the bronze statue itself. So if they had a statue that weighed you know twelve hundred kilograms, they would get paid a, well a kilogram was worth of bronze at the in nineteen forty one and forty two. Um, uh, a lot of people, uh, they were, you know, they, they basically spoke, said that statues that were unimportant to the history of France were to be removed, or just, or just find the ugly ones, which they called uh, in in their correspondence turnips. Um, and so they went about doing this, and, and there was a a, a group. Uh, there would be a there was a board with the finance administration, the uh, the, the the French uh, metals administration. Uh, to to review the list that were sent by departments uh, removing statues, um, and so uh, and several historians have argued that members of those panels um, were probably anti-statue mani, you know, people that just hated all these statues that were put up and wanted to clean country of all these excess statues, and so I showed you. A picture, a, a photograph from Pierre Yon. He uh, he came he went around Paris to document all the statues that were being destroyed by the Vichy and German government, um, and and you know showing this is the death of the center tower, he's called it, uh, showing how how these statues were destroyed, and it's it's interesting that the, the, there were so many towns that. Would send the mayors would then write letters to the to the DC government say, you know, do we really have to take these statues down? Come on, you know. And they were said, oh, you do. And then and but the Frank, but the uh, the Vichy government said, you could then if if you really love the statue, you can replace it, but only in stone, which is a lot more expensive, and than, than bronze. And so this is a I'm going to show you a case study. And this is um, this is a statue uh, of Jules de Mont de Durville. He was a French explorer and uh, naval hero during uh, during the, uh, I guess, uh, Napoleon the Third's time. Uh, in uh, he was the hometown hero in Condé sur Mer, which is in the uh, Calvados department. And the Vichy government said that that statue had to be removed. And you can see in the in this slide picture here, there was just an empty pedestal. The bronze tablet on the pedestal is, is remaining. It's just a statue. And this you see throughout a lot of towns in France. Um, and the iron fence, which probably had more wartime value, is remaining, you know. So so they came back and the, the uh, town raised the money in 1943 and and hired an artist replicate statue in stone. This is actually the clay model that they photographed to send back to, to Vichy to, um, to get approval. And, uh, and of course, 
the the, the monument, the um, the administration then put on all kinds of new stipulations. Well, you know, his ears, one ear is too long. You know, got to change this, got to change that. And but they, but this town, this this municipality, uh, eventually persevered and got it, got their statue of Urvue uh, buried in stone and placed on that back on that pedestal. But a lot of times they didn't. So, but what's also interesting after the Second World War is that municipalities throughout France came back and replaced statues, I mean, restored statues that had been destroyed during the war. This is a statue of Queen Victoria with four allegorical figures around her in Nice, each one representing uh, Cannes, uh, Nice, uh, Menton, and I can't remember the last one. But and German soldiers during the Second World War came and they knocked off all the heads off the, these statues, knocked off all the arms. And the Nice government, this is in the semi section quarter of, of Nice, which is a pretty wealthy part of Nice. They had stored the statue, and then after the Second World War, they painstakingly rebuilt the statue using the fragments. Some of the fragments didn't make it like that, like Queen Victoria's hands, but you can see here in the around the neck of the uh, niece figure where it had been, def been knocked off, how uh, it was reattached to her. So that these are an interesting thing. So I mean, there's this life, death, and life that I've seen in iconoclasm in France, especially with the Second World War, but not always. And this is another example. Oops, of of a iconoclastic act and then another iconoclastic act. This is the Francois Argo statue base in, in, near, in the, near the medical school in Paris. Uh, Argo was a famous um, or celebrated um, astronomer in the Paris observatories right across the street from this statue base and a politician. Uh, and he was targeted by the Vichy government to be removed and his statue was destroyed. Now, this pedestal remained empty, and it's still empty today, um, but it, it, very little had been changed with it. There's a, a, another pedestal just around across the street from it that has been, hasn't been touched by, as, an art, as a new art installation, but this one has been. And so the city of Paris back in, in 1994 uh, commissioned the installation artist Jan Dibbets from um, He's a Dutch inst installation artist to reinterpret, reinvent Argo's monument. And since Argo was a noted astronomer, uh, Dibbets proposed a series of disks that would span across the, the north south med longitudinal median, which the statue happens to be on, of Paris. So if you know where you're looking, walking down the street, you can see these disks saying Ar Argo. On them, and then one kind of culminating as a climax on this pedestal. And then, of course, there's a description right at the base of the pedestal that describes what, what happened to, to Argo, the statue, and how it has been re reinvented. So you can see in this example, you have an iconoclastic art act, namely by the Vichy Nazi regime, then a new act to reinterpret, a new iconoclastic act to reinterpret the meaning of the statue and its original iconoclastic act. So you could see this kind of chain going on. So I, I, that I find very interesting. Now, the net, I'm kind of getting ready to wrap up. So, uh, but today we start to see a lot of ideas about art and iconoclasm, not just vandalism. Uh, and this is an example, this was, this was, um, this was just uh, unfold, you know, presented back in December. This is the counter monument and counter epigraphy for the David Dupuy uh, monument in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. And what's interesting about this statue, the statue, uh, the original statue of Dupuy celebrates uh, a figure that in, in this town's, in this municipality's um, history that's very, conf very conflicted. On one hand, he was a great benefactor 18th century, 19th century benefactor. 
of uh, this of the Swiss town um, gave the hospital, gave the bay, I mean, gave the uh, park. You know, all the all the great good things. But he made his he made his fortune on the slave trade. He was a slave broker, and um, and I think he was also a sugar broker, which was also related to the slave trade in the 18th century. And um, so African American and African activists came, and they had been they had painted the statue red, and they tried to pull the pull the bronze statue off the pedestal. Um, so. There was a debate between in the municipality about what to do with the statue, and the this, the municipal council came up with a referendum. One, and, and on that ballot was one to get rid of the monument, two to uh, uh, and destroy the monument, two to relocate it to a a neutral site like a museum, or three to reinterpret the site in situ. And uh, so that's what they they did. They they reinterpreted the site, and um, and by commissioning an artist named Fraud Fraud uh, to to develop a, a counter monument, and that's to put upside down and in the ground, and a new interpretation, a, a, a counter epigraphy, um, a new explanation of this man in stone or bronze. Uh, as a way of reconciling the, the difficult history with the heritage of his of a statue in their town square. Now that's a solution, and I mean I think that was a very good solution. But epigraphy, counter epigraphy, and counter monument, I'm learning through my research, can also be used as a weapon of war. And this is where I come in with the Ukrainian Russian Ukrainian war. Um, Months, a couple, about a month or two before the Russians invaded Ukraine, they had they had special troops come in literally in the, de in the dead of night and change the mine uh, tablets on monuments and even change some monuments in Ukraine to try to obliterate Ukrainian identity and to celebrate Soviet Russian identity. Uh, in in Ukraine, so as a way of t trying to tell people in Ukraine that they really are Russian. So you can see now that this this is this idea of iconoclasm is becoming much more than than something that's just happening in the, and by mobs on the street. It's a it's a very sophisticated idea that we're starting to see uh, all across the world, not only just in Russia and Ukraine, but in Africa, Armenia, and in China uh, and Taiwan. So I'm going to wrap up, I think I'm a few minutes early, so that's good. Uh, I'll wrap up my talk about, about what iconoclasm has become. And uh, it is a complex act. It's subject, to, it is subject to change. I think that's the thing that is so interesting, is that there's, it, the, it is, as permanent as we think a statue is, that we put up a, a stone or bronze statue in, and say it's going to be there in perpetuity. Uh, the same idea of putting it down and that it would never come back is also something that is not exactly true, too. So, I mean, statues have a way of, of coming and going. And then, of course, meanings have a way of being trans transformed on them uh, to completely change what we think of them, like the Flame of Victory or the Argo Monument. Um, and one of the things that, that we're learning that I think the United States should take into consideration from France is the, is the importance of the architectural idea of convenance, that, that a statue, that a statue, especially a statue put placed in a, in a, in a municipal square a hundred years ago, the square was designed for it and that to remove it, you will have a gaping hole. And I think I'm, I can see that happening uh, with the de Klerk, uh, de Klerk monument in Pontoise. When you take that down, it's, on a, it's at, the, at the top of a really grand staircase going to the, to the cathedral. Um, I think when you remove that, I think there will be some, some really emptiness. So, so architecture and art do work together, especially in, in classical Beaux-Arts art. So, um, so 
I think Lowenthal, in his writings, talks about that it's an elusive objective to use iconoclasm as a, as a means for a cultural amnesia. And Lynn Meskel, another heritage expert from, from the University of Pennsylvania, concurs, especially in her studies of the difficulties of obliterating uh, Nazi, the Nazi past in Germany. Um, but I think one of the things in, in my field is that iconoclasm is, is something that we perhaps thought was not going to be a vestige of the past, but it is now something that is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. So thank you.